talk about a bunch of ideas, uh, only some of which are in my own work, but I just wanted to mention at the beginning uh, that the part of it that is my own work was done and published uh, about 10 years ago in a PRL, and then just recently Chris Ealing, Raph Gudens, and I extended this work a little bit, and uh, that's also now published, and I'll try in this talk to actually describe both the original idea and uh, the new elaboration of it. I only have a, an hour to speak, so I should, I can't go um, into all the details, but I hope the basic ideas will come across. So the starting point, and really, uh, but not the ending point, is black hole entropy. So there's this amazing formula that the black hole or bekenstein hawking entropy is one quarter of the area in Planck units, the Planck length squared, I'll just remind you, being h bar g over c cubed. It's a tiny length, the Planck length. And uh, for everything I'm saying, that's really crucial at the central point, that the Planck length that appears in this formula is just shorter than every other length scale that we deal with in physics. Uh, so it's got Planck's constant, and so that's quantum mechanics, and it has g, so that's gravity. This is some kind of a message from quantum gravity. Um, normally, entropy is the logarithm of the number of states in the system that we're talking about in statistical thermodynamics. So presumably, this is the log of the number of states, but we don't know what the states are yet because we don't understand quantum gravity. It's quite a strange situation that we know the answer to that question without even knowing what the theory is. And that's really the puzzle. Can we, so what is the message this is telling us from quantum gravity? Is there any uh, hope of using this as a kind of springboard into the theory or a, uh, a way to see into that theory deeper than, than just the formula on the face of it? So that's the goal, that's the general uh, question that's been posed. And the very first step is to realize or to you know, argue that black hole entropy really has nothing to do with black holes fundamentally. It's really, we discovered it first in the context of black holes, but the actual thing we're talking about here is horizon entropy, not black hole entropy. Um, so I'm claiming that, well, first of all, everybody knows, uh, probably even if you're not anywhere close to this field, you've heard that a de Sitter, that is a cosmological horizon, also is understood, believed to have an entropy that's given by the exact same formula. And already that's a huge leap, because a black hole, if it's sitting there, um, is a kind of well-defined region of the space-time that every observer can agree on is there. You don't, that is, you don't have to select a particular observer to identify what you mean by the black hole horizon. But a de Sitter horizon is completely different. Each, uh, not each observer, but there are many different de Sitter horizons in de Sitter space. Pick one inertial observer, and that one goes on for all time in de Sitter space and has a certain horizon. If you just move over to another spot and take another inertial observer, you have a different de Sitter horizon. So there's no objective de Sitter horizon sitting there in de Sitter space, and yet every one of them has this entropy, A, or entropy density, uh, one-fourth the area over Planck length squared. But once you've made that leap, it seems inevitable, although psychologically, apparently, uh, many researchers are not willing to make the leap, it, it seems inevitable that uh, also an acceleration horizon, a Rindler horizon, has an entropy given by the same formula. It's a little uncomfortable because a Rindler horizon and acceleration horizon is of infinite area, so the entropy is infinite. But the point here is that it's really the entropy density that this formula tells us. It's one quarter is the entropy density. Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. Will you explain why the black hole entropy extends to the Sita entropy? No. Because I guess I'm not questioning that. Okay. You can read this paper. So uh, I just wanted to say the evidence for all of this is uh, comes from many places. Uh, the first law of horizon, the first law of black hole thermodynamics generalizes to other horizons uh, in, in strict analogy. Uh, 
As far as getting from a de Sitter horizon to a Rindler horizon, you can take the limit of zero cosmological constant, or you can consider a black hole horizon where the mass of the black hole goes to infinity, and locally, uh, there can be no distinction between a little piece of a giant black hole horizon and an acceleration horizon, unless we have some mystical idea that a black hole is different. But physics is local, is, is the point of view of my talk, and really, I think, a, a sustainable point of view. So I believe that uh, that argument is convincing. You can also, there's also evidence from calculations in semi-classical quantum gravity of pair creation rates for black holes, like in an external magnetic field, where the entropy you would associate with the acceleration horizon of the uh, final and initial metrics comes into the calculation in just the way you would expect if the number of states available for the transition were reflected in uh, to receive a contribution from the acceleration horizon entropy. And also you can look at uh, transition rates for quantum systems like an unruh detector near an acceleration horizon and uh, the transition rate also similarly to here is governed in a way that you would expect by the area change of the horizon. So all of these arguments are uh, summarized in this review article that Renaud Parentani and I wrote called Horizon Entropy. And I guess really the main purpose of the article was to make the case, summarize the case for this claim. So I won't go into it in this talk, but that's where all the arguments I could possibly give you are located at the moment. So the starting point of this talk is that that's well, I believe that's true, and so what, what are the consequences? So, 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 so this depends a lot the some other properties of black hole horizons, like the membrane paradigm, does that also extend to the horizon? Yes, as you'll see. So, in fact, um, so the basic idea is to, uh, to uh, take this notion of black hole thermodynamics and localize it to uh, not just any sort of globally defined horizon, but to a local notion of horizon around every point in space-time. So if this is just supposed to be a summary of the, a look forward at the rest of the talk. I just want to uh, put up there where we're headed. So uh, I want to say that I invite you to think about any point in space-time setting up a, um, a two-dimensional plane at one instant through that point. And it really doesn't matter where the plane goes when you get far away from the point, and, and consider the, uh, the boundary of the past, the causal past of that plane, and, and that boundary will be a null surface, and it will have a lot in common with uh, a piece of, a, of an event horizon of a black hole. And I want to consider the thermodynamics of that horizon. And specifically, I want to consider a situation where, uh, well, first of all, I'm going to think of that horizon just like we think of a black hole as a kind of heat bath, and that it has a universal entropy density per unit area, eta, so that the entropy is just the area times eta. And then I want to consider uh, transitions um, where heat flows into the system. The heat is delta Q, and this is supposed to just indicate heat flowing across. And I'll make clear what heat means. It's basically energy appropriately identified. And according to a Clausius relation between heat and entropy change, uh, ds is delta Q over T. This is really an expression you know, in the foundations of thermodynamics of the second law of thermodynamics, the existence of an integrating factor for the heat flow that identifies that there exists a function, the entropy. Um, is really an expression of the second law. And so I'm just going to invoke that relation with delta Q appropriately identified as a form of energy. And T will be identified as the unroot temperature of this local acceleration horizon. And what I want to show you is that these assumptions imply that, uh, well, it's clear, they imply that the since uh, the entropy changes and the entropy is proportional to the area, the area must change. So the area must change in a way that's related to the energy that flows across the horizon. But that means that the area of this horizon can't be constant, first of all, even if it's uh, constant up here at this point. 
So that means that the null geodesics that generate the horizon are focusing or are bending. And the bending means that there's curvature in the space time. And in particular, if we impose this condition for all such horizons everywhere in space time, we can argue that it's only consistent if Einstein's equation holds. So Einstein's equation is a consequence of this Clausius relation, the area entropy density, and this identification of heat. Also, well, Einstein's equation has Newton's constant in it, whereas this, these two assumptions don't mention Newton's constant anywhere. I'd like to tell you what's the Newton constant that comes out. It's 1 over 4 h bar times eta the universal entropy density. So that's, that's where we're headed. But before we jump onto the path of um, giving you the, the details of the, of the reasoning, I want to consider an analogy which is uh, more familiar and uh, more transparent, uh, which maybe is nice to keep in mind while we're looking at this case. The analogy is a situation in physics where there's also uh, two length scales that are very different. In this case, there's this uh, Planck length that I emphasized at the beginning, and the other long length scale might be, say, the radius of curvature of the space-time that Einstein's equation uh, governs. And in the analogy, um, well, the analogy is gases. So uh, back at the beginning of the 19th century, experiments with chemical reactions of gases showed that there are simple relations between the volume of the, uh, of the gases before a reaction and the volumes after. And from a number of experiments and theorizing, it was finally realized by Avogadro that the number of molecules is universally proportional to the volume of a gas at fixed temperature and pressure, which is a quite an amazing thing if you think about it that this uh, macroscopic measurement of volume, pressure, and temperature tells you this microscopic number. And it's sort of analogous to how the black hole entropy is telling us macroscopically a microscopic number, the number of states of the quantum space-time, whatever it is. And just like we don't know what quantum space-time is, Avogadro didn't know what an atom was. He didn't know how a chemical reaction worked. He did have to figure out one thing for this whole scheme to work out, which I learned about recently. The scheme didn't work uh, until he realized that many of the elementary gases were in fact composed of diatomic molecules. And only by realizing that, that the molecule could split, and that a gas of a given volume could turn into twice the volume just by splitting, and still satisfy this relation that the number is proportional to the volume, before he realized that, the scheme didn't work. And I've been reading recently his uh, paper about this, just out of fascination. It's really interesting that he had this insight. This is not relevant to my talk, but I just want to mention it. He realized it must be that these molecules are splitting. And then he immediately, in deep insight, exactly right, and then he immediately made a mistake, where he said, and they can not only divide, but you can also separate them, divide them again into 4 or 8 or 16, he immediately theorized that it was always a power of 2 that you could divide the molecule into. So he injected a theoretical idea about the microscopic theory that was irrelevant. He mentioned immediately, in my experience, I've only seen cases where I needed to take the division into 2 into account. <laughs> Nevertheless, it could be into 4 or 8, etc. So it's really uh, intriguing that the steps we take in science, which are profound, you know, really have to be small enough to be correct. And, and always, pretty much, we, we take too big a step. And then our colleagues have to, to just tell us to forget everything except the first good idea. So anyway, he got that right. How we know, and, and people figured out shortly after that, that, that it's not just that the volume is proportional to the number of fixed pressure and temperature, but you know if you change the pressure and temperature, there's other scaling relations that hold, and they're summarized in this equation of state that everybody knows for an ideal gas. 
And this accounts for, like I just said, for the proportionality with V of V with N and much more. So I want to show you a, uh, how you could derive this equation of state if all you knew was the entropy of the gas, a certain property, not even the entropy formula, a certain property of the entropy that you could get just from the fact that the molecules are tiny compared to the volume that the gas occupies. And this is going to be analogous to the fact that we're getting that the area entropy of a horizon scales with the area just from the fact that the Planck length is so small and nothing else. So the molecules, here are the assumptions that lead to this. The molecules are tiny. The entropy is not only the entropy in thermodynamics, but it's Boltzmann's constant times the log of the number of states, the Clausius relation I just said before, and the fact that energy is conserved. Those assumptions imply this in the following way. So the fact that the molecules are so small, they occupy almost no volume, that means if we're counting up the number of states of n particles, it must be the volume to the nth power times some function of the energy that I don't know and need to know for this argument. This, I, I'm just saying, follows merely from this qualitative property that the molecules are tiny. So the entropy is k times the log of that. When I take the log, I get n log v plus some other thing. And this tells me that the partial derivative of the entropy with respect to volume is just uh, nk over v. And that's all I need. As you probably already see, imposing the Clausius relation, and then energy conservation tells us that the heat that flows into the system is the change of its energy uh, minus the work it does. And so expanding this, thinking of S as a function of energy and volume, this tells us that the partial derivative of entropy with respect to volume must be just P divided by T. That's it. But we just inferred uh, from counting that, on the other hand, that same partial derivative is nk over d, and therefore pv equals nkt. So this logic uh, is, is impeccable. It's incredible, actually, how much I think we learned from it. A simple fact about the smallness of the molecules, and that's exactly what I'm going to do to derive the Einstein equation as an equation of state from horizon entropy. Well, to, be, to get off the ground, we have to have a, a system in thermal equilibrium that we're going to apply the Clausius relation to. Where is the system? I'm just talking about empty space. The system is everywhere. So this is vacuum as thermal equilibrium. So here's a picture of one of these local acceleration horizons, the local Riddler horizons, and actually the whole thing is modeled on flat space quantum field theory. So what I really want to do here is just re remind you about or explain to you if you never saw it, the Unruh effect in flat space quantum field theory. According to this effect, the vacuum of a Lorentz invariant quantum field theory looks like a thermal state when viewed from the point of view of an accelerating observer. And here's a, a sharp statement of what that means. So we take 0, 0, the projection onto the vacuum state of this field theory, and carve up space into left and right hand wedges and trace over the left hand side and form this density matrix row right. That is a description of the vacuum as far as it could possibly affect any observable confined to the right hand wedge. I haven't said anything about acceleration yet. I will later, but for now it's just observables in the region are, from, from their point of view, the state is this mixed state density matrix. And the statement is that density matrix actually has the form of a thermal state, where the Hamiltonian H boost is the generator of the boost symmetry of Minkowski space around this point. That means the Lorentz transformations that leave this point, or really this plane, because I'm suppressing two dimensions, leave it invariant. So we could write it this way. TAB is a stress energy tensor for the field, whatever it is. 
I contract it with chi A, the killing vector that generates this boost symmetry. Uh, here I a couple of flow lines of that killing field. It's like a hyperbolic rotation around this point. So that's the current of boost energy. And then I compute its uh, integral over a spatial surface sigma b. I didn't draw the spatial surface, but that's supposed to be just a slice here. And that's the generator of boost transformations on the quantum fields in the region R. So that's the Hamiltonian. And then T is just h bar over 2 pi. It's a, a kind of dimensionless temperature. The reason it's dimensionless is that, and, and doesn't have dimensions of energy, is that h doesn't have dimensions of energy. And that's because this is the generator of translations in the hyperbolic angle rather than the generator of translations in time. And so angle is dimensionless, and so the temperature is dimensionless when h bar is set to 1. So this is just a, a fact about Lorentz invariant quantum field theory in flat space. Um, it goes, it was first proved in a different language by Bisignano and Vickman. It's, it's essentially the same as the Unruh effect uh, the direct connection to the under effect is the following. Suppose I'm an observer now here, a particular one following this hyperbolic world line. That's an orbit of the killing vector. So for me, everything is stationary along that line because it's one of the it's a flow line of the symmetry transformation of the space. Uh, and if I rescale the hyperbolic angle along here to match my proper time, then this temperature turns into a real temperature. It just gets scaled by, it turns out, the acceleration of my world line. So h bar acceleration over 2 pi is the local temperature of this state, and that's the unruh temperature. And I'll need this in a second. If I measure the uh, distance of this curve to this point uh, on a straight line, I get a proper distance l, and it turns out the acceleration is just 1 over l. So the temperature goes like 1 over L. So if I, pro if I take an extremely accelerated observer, the temperature goes to it, becomes very large. OK, and uh, so that's a thermal state. So I can look at the vacuum in flat space around every point as a thermal state. It has this temperature, and it has entropy, because this is a mixed state density matrix. And I can uh, write down the entropy minus trace, rho, riot, log, rho. That's called the entanglement entropy of the vacuum. Yeah. Is, is that the, uh, what is that um, in the uh, first line? Which? There's a big Z in the first line. Oh, that's just to normalize no, this. That's not normalization. Yeah, that's, that is the trace of that whole thing. Yeah. So what about this entropy? What is it equal to? Well, we can actually easily conclude that it's infinite. Uh, if we think of this as a thermal uh, bath of massless radiation as one example, uh, we know that the entropy density goes like temperature cubed. So integrating up all the entropy, I have to integrate by the volume element d area, that's the transverse uh, area, and dl, the radial length from the horizon. And then putting in the fact that the temperature goes like 1 over the length cubed, I get, and the fact that nothing depends on the area, I, I bring out a factor of area and I get a divergence, an ultraviolet divergence that's 1 over L squared. So the entropy is infinite if I include all of it, uh, and it scales like 1 over the cutoff length squared. So since this entropy, or its analog outside the horizon of a black hole, must contribute to the budget of entropy for an observer that stays outside a black hole, and since a black hole has a finite entropy, the bekenstein hawking entropy, it must be that this cannot be, we can't take the cutoff to zero. There must be a cutoff that makes this answer finite. Yeah. Can you get back to the question that I raised before? So if you look at two-point functions in this state, and you see that they're not thermal in the usual Minkowski sense. Example, They're precisely thermal in the sense that this state has this precisely thermal form. If you 
for example, have the energy densities and pressures, then you, then you find, you don't find P equals one third rho. They're precisely thermal in the sense that the density matrix has a precisely thermal form with respect to the boost Hamiltonian. That's the only thing I'm asserting. But is that enough to say thermal? It's a and maximum so entropy. When you maximize the entropy at fixed boost energy, you get this density matrix. It's the Gibbs state. That's all I'm asserting. So once we uh, accept that it must somehow be cut off, we don't know how yet, could it be that this is the source of all the black hole entropy? So remember the black hole entropy went like area over Planck length squared, so it looks like maybe so. If the cutoff is the Planck length, then we get something of the right order of magnitude. On the other hand, there's a famous problem with this, often called the species problem, of course, the entropy we get would depend on how many fields we have, and also on the details of how those fields interact. And so how could it possibly be when we add them all up, we get exactly area over four Planck length squared? Well, it could be if it just so happened that the sum of all the L cutoff to the minus twos, that is, if, if were to equal the Planck length to the minus two, in other words, if the inverse renormalized Newton constant that enters the Bekenstein hopping entropy, in fact, were equal to the sum of these contributions. Okay, so that seems, it could be, but it seems like an artificial arrangement, perhaps. Well, maybe it can happen, you know, like, uh, the, 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 the cattle could be somehow, like, presumed implemented dynamically that if you reach a certain, you know, High energy, you start seeing the, the fall off of your own spectral function. But if you put lots and lots of fields in, maybe, maybe you can influence where uh, the, the energy where this, this uh, kind of thing happens. So right. It's not unthinkable. Right. Well, in fact, that's the point of this uh, slide is that if we, if we think about how does adding fields affect the value of the renormalized Newton constant, just at the level of the effective action? Of course, if you toss in another field into your theory, if you held everything else fixed, you'd get a new value of the renormalized Newton constant. And in fact, it was suggested by uh, Susskind and Newman and myself and checked in a beautiful quantitative calculation, first by Demers, LaFrance, and Myers, that in fact, this is a calculation in free field theory where they tossed in some new kind of field, put regulated this entropy with Pelli Villar's regularization and compared the contribution of that field to the renormalization of 1 over h bar g, compared that to its contribution to the entanglement entropy of the black hole atmosphere, they're thinking about black holes, not general horizons, uh, they got, in fact, that precisely the contribution is a over 4 times the corresponding change in the renormalization of 1 over h g. So it's a very precise computational evidence in the context of free field theory uh, on a background that this is true. In fact, they found more than that. They showed that the next order correction term to the effective action for gravity, which includes curvature squared terms, is also balanced by a lower order correction to the entanglement entropy of the corresponding field. And uh, so it's really quite impressive. So this gives the idea immediately that we could maybe maintain the idea that black hole entropy is nothing but horizon entanglement entropy, but only if somehow 1 over the bare Newton constant, whatever that is, were 0. Otherwise, we'd have a contribution from the bare gravity, and then all this sort of renormalization adding on to it. But if entanglement entropy is everything, we'd have to, in some sense, have 1 over the bare Newton constant be 0. Now, there is no real meaning, as far as I know it, to the bare coupling constant in a theory that's not renormalizable. And even if it is renormalizable, it might be that the bare coupling is 0 or something. I mean, it's, it's not a concept we know how to handle in the way we do effective field theory. So I put it in quotes. 
But you get the idea that if somehow there were no contribution other than the entanglement, this goes under the name of induced gravity, then, uh, then we would have this identification of entanglement entropy and, and um, black hole entropy. And the claim I, one claim I'd like to make is that thermodynamic reasoning, the one I'll show you now, actually implies that it must be this way. There is no choice but that the Newton constant we see at low energies is identified, in effect, with the entanglement entropy of all of the states that can influence us, that is, the ones that enter into the thermodynamic, um, well, the changes of entropy governed by the Clausius relation. So here's, now I'm going to the part where I'll actually try to show you more specifically how I infer the Einstein equation must hold and with that particular value of Newton's constant. So this is just supposed to be a picture of a stationary black hole horizon. These lines are the null generators, null geodesics. Here's a light coming at one point. Here's a cross section of the horizon that would be like a space-like two-sphere. And at a point on that horizon, just a little section of that two-sphere uh, I'm taking it out and drawing it over here, and in fact, picking an arbitrary point in the space-time. I'm thinking of that as my equilibrium point, just like any point on the horizon of a black hole. Drawing a space-like two-surface through that point, which on my picture appears as a one-surface, and then taking the boundary of the past of that on one side, and that's ruled by null generators, and that's my local horizon to which I will apply the Clausius relation. So it doesn't have the same symmetry that flat space has. So I don't have a boost killing field with respect to which I can define a temperature precisely, the unroot temperature. But all I really need to do is zoom in on the neighborhood of that point and use the fact that whatever the length scale of curvature in my space time is, I can look more uh, in a neighborhood of P that's much smaller than that length scale. And since the Planck length is so tiny, unless the curvature of the space time starts to get near the Planck length, there's no obstruction to me looking at it this way. So I zoom in on this point, and now it's almost like flat space. And I have an approximate boost killing vector field. And I can define heat flux across my uh, horizon, just like uh, using the boost energy current with the approximate boost killing field. We checked in our recent paper quantitatively that the um, that the ambiguities in chi don't affect this argument. So you can just do an expansion in Riemann normal coordinates around p and um, make the argument local that way. And I need one technical fact uh, that this boost killing field on the horizon. It's a vector field that's going to point this way. I've oriented it so it's pointing towards P instead of away, uh, and it's a, null, it's a null flow on this horizon. The boost killing field flows up to the point P, and uh, so it's parallel to the tangent vector K to the uh, null generators of the horizon. So lambda here is an affine parameter along those null generators. And a crucial thing here is that I have, have minus lambda because I'm counting P as lambda equals zero. So to the past of P, I have negative lambda. And lambda is zero at the point P, so chi is zero there. And that's true. That's like the, uh, uh, the, the central point of a rotation killing field where the killing flow goes to zero. In other words, the fixed point of the killing flow is P. And uh, that means that um, actually an infinite amount of killing time passes as I flow up to P. So P is my equilibrium point, and in terms of killing time, it takes an infinitely long time to get to P. So things change very slowly with respect to killing time. And it's in that sense that the world at P looks like uh, an equilibrium configuration uh, with respect to, and a thermal state with respect to the boost Hamiltonian at the, unroom, at the temperature h bar over 2 pi. Are you assuming that P is the bifurcation two-sphere, or are you... Uh, P is a point. Through P, I draw an arbitrary two-surface, and then that two-surface is identified right with a... Well, the tangent plane to that two-surface at P 
is identified with the bifurcation plane of, a, of the local Riedler horizon. So yeah, it's exactly like the bifurcation plane. It's eight points on the bifurcation plane. So now I'm just going to evaluate all the terms in the Clausius relation and deduce the Einstein equation. Maybe I should, I messed up my, uh, Okay, so delta S is delta Q over T. First, I have to write down what, how I evaluate the change in entropy. It's eta times the change in area. The change in area can be written as the expansion, the integral of the expansion times the affine parameter change times the area over the horizon. The expansion is just defined as derivative of the area element with respect to lambda divided by the area. So you see if I just put that in there, the area elements cancel. Then I have a total derivative with respect to lambda, and that picks out the area change. It's called the expansion of the horizon generating null nucleus. And delta Q is the integral of the boost energy current over the horizon. Uh, K d lambda dA is just the volume element on the horizon. And now putting in the formula I said before that chi is minus lambda K, this just becomes minus lambda stress energy tensor of kk d lambda dA. Now, a crucial observation is that this is linear in lambda. So it goes to zero at the equilibrium point. That means there's no heat flowing into the system at the equilibrium point. And the rate of heat flowing in goes to zero asymptotically as you approach that point. If I compare this if I impose delta S equals delta Q over T, and delta Q has an integrand that's linear in lambda, delta S better also have an integrand that's linear in lambda. So the expansion must vanish at the point P. I infer that the expansion must vanish at the point P. Now, how does the expansion behave? To evaluate this integral, I need to know theta as a function of lambda. And that's given by the focusing equation often called the Rachel Dury equation, but I think it's actually not. I think he derived the analogous equation for the flow of a volume element. And this equation was written by Ray Sachs and also Newman and Penrose. Anyway, it's just an aside. So there's this equation that just follows from the geodesic equation for null geodesics, that the rate of change of the expansion along a flow of null geodesics is minus a half expansion squared minus the shear squared minus the Ricci tensor contracted twice with the tangent vectors and congruence. And since, as I just said, we have to, to satisfy the Clausius relation, the expansion must vanish at lambda equals zero. Uh, the first, if I make a Taylor expansion of theta around lambda equals zero, the first order term must be this one. There is no zeroth order term. And then there are corrections at order lambda squared. So this is what I should put into the integram. So I do that here. Theta is minus lambda sigma sigma plus r. And as I said, T is going to be h bar over 2 pi, the unroot temperature. And now we've got all the ingredients, and we set them equal. Now what does that mean? Remember that P could be any point in space time. And also, once I pick the point, my two-dimensional plane, I could orient in any direction in space. So by changing the orientation of the plane and changing the point, if all of those integrals are going to be equal to each other, it must be that the integrands are equal. So I infer that uh, this integrand must be equal to, or divided by t, must be equal to this integrand. For all k's, for all orientations of the surface, that's not possible unless the shear vanishes. I can, you can see why in the following way. Uh, without changing k, I can change the shear by changing the derivative of k. And that amounts to a kind of distortion of the surface at p. If I take a plane in Riemann normal coordinates, uh, then I'll have zero shear at p. But if I warp the plane, in an astigmatic way, I can produce a shear at p without changing the value of k there. And therefore, I cannot uh, satisfy this without killing off the sigma term. So 
This is part of our new work. Uh, the re when I first did this, I set sigma to zero at p on the grounds that p is an equilibrium point. So nothing should be changing there. So the area should, so the expansion and shear should vanish. But then I, now we realize that's incorrect. Because since an infinite amount of killing time flows as you approach p, as long as things are changing at a finite rate with respect to, let's say, a proper time, they're automatically changing at zero rate with respect to killing time. So equilibrium by itself does not say that sigma must vanish, but this argument says that sigma must vanish. So considering then those horizons for which sigma vanishes, and I'll come back to the now, I'll come back to this condition uh, in a moment. I infer that uh, I kill off this term. The Ricci tensor contracted twice with K must be proportional to the stress energy tensor contracted twice with K. So I get the Einstein equation up to a tensor proportional to the metric. I can't determine the tensor proportional to the metric because when I contract that with a null vector twice, I get zero anyway. So I get the trace free Einstein equation only everything but the trace, with, an, with a Newton constant, if you trace it through, that's equal to 1 over 4 h bar a. Then to get the trace part of the Einstein equation, I, you know, I haven't used energy conservation yet. You might have no, noted. And remember the analogy with uh, the ideal gas law. We had to combine the Clausius relation with the first law of thermodynamics. Somewhere energy conservation entered the argument. And so far, I haven't used energy conservation anywhere. I still got the trace-free Einstein equation, but I didn't get the whole thing. If I now impose that the energy momentum tensor of the matter that I've put into the heat flow is divergence-free, that's local energy conservation, I can then infer that the undetermined part of the Einstein equation, that is the trace part, must just be given by a constant lambda times the metric. And that's an undetermined cosmological constant in the derivation. So this is the basis of my claim that there is no way to avoid the conclusion, given thermodynamics, that the low energy Newton constant we actually see in nature is precisely related to the universal entropy density of horizons by this formula. You know that uh, that Carnot didn't use the conservation of energy to get the entropy. You don't need it in the entropy. You don't need it to get the existence then, of the entropy. And then, and then he was on top of it, and then he died. But he was going to use the conservation of energy and to get the equation of state of ideal gas. We tell me that story later. <laughs> Okay, now let me come back, and this I find fascinating, partly because it's the last, most recent thing I've looked at on this. I come back to the question about the shear here. You see, if it's really true that the system is in equilibrium and Clausius relations should hold, I shouldn't have the freedom to only consider local causal horizons whose shear happens to vanish. Right? I mean, it's not, if it's really thermodynamics, it's thermodynamics. So, so what about that shear? Um, so I have to consider the shear viscosity of the horizon. If the shear doesn't vanish, then uh, what we figured out is that means we shouldn't be imposing the Clausius relation anyway. You see, the point P is an equilibrium point, but as we flow into P, we're just approaching equilibrium. And you know that in a system that's near equilibrium, uh, if you have gradients in the you know, uh, border parameter or whatever, in the classical variables that describe the flow, that leads to a rate of dissipation or internal energy entropy production, labeled here D sub I of S. That stands for internal. So the actual Clausius relation that we need to use is that the entropy change is the heat flux in divided by T plus any internal entropy production. Now we first thought of this in, in the context of adding higher curvature terms and became terrified that we have no idea. How, how do you figure out what the internal entropy production rate is for one of these things? 
But you know, in the context of non-equilibrium thermodynamics, it's, it's almost a universal thing. You just the form of an internal entropy production is a square of your, of your inhomogeneity quantity uh, divided by temperature times some, some unit phenomenological coefficient. It just always has to have that form. And so in fact, if we were talking about a fluid, uh, this would be precisely the form of entropy production rate per unit time, per unit well, it would be volume in that case, but I'm writing area for the horizon. It would have exactly this form where, where uh, what is this letter? Zeta is the shear viscosity. I put a hat on here because the time I should, the time that appears in this formula is the time whose correspond conjugate Hamiltonian is the one in which, which characterizes the equilibrium state. Whereas my sigma, as I previously referred to, was measured as the rate of shear with respect to affine parameter. So I have to correct for that first before I try to compare this formula. So this is derivative with respect to affine parameter. I then multiply by derivative of affine parameter with respect to killing time. And I get what's, what I'm calling sigma hat. So if I simply postulate this is, as it always is, the rate of internal entropy production, I find that that will precisely cancel this term. Because look, it's sigma sigma, provided I identify the shear viscosity in the appropriate way. So what is that way? It should be eta, the universal entropy density, times the temperature over 2. Or in other words, h bar 8 over 4 pi, or in terms of Newton's constant, 1 over 16 pi g. This is exactly the shear viscosity of the horizon inferred by uh, Thorn and um, Price, Price and Thorn, in the membrane paradigm of black hole thermodynamics, looking at the horizon as a fluid with various material properties, they inferred essentially by a, a very closely related analysis, but obviously not the same because I don't have a black hole here, uh, that a, a black hole horizon has this shear viscosity. But I've inferred here that, it can, that any local causal horizon has the same shear viscosity. OK, I just said that part. There's a bit of a puzzle at first. You know, a shear viscosity, what determines the shear viscosity of a fluid? It's the microscopic structure and interactions of the fluid. So how is it that we're able to calculate, ideally, in sort of closed form, the shear viscosity of this system? And the answer is, well, we're not really, because the answer comes out proportional to eta. And eta is the universal entropy density is 100% phenomenological. We have no theory of eta. I just postulated it at the beginning. So the fact, in fact, the shear viscosity is phenomenological. But it's still puzzling, maybe, that it's perfectly proportional to the entropy density. The ratio of shear viscosity to entropy density is universal. And why is that? I think I'll skip this blah blah so I can get on to some other things. I especially want to mention this, though. Recent work by uh, Paula Castro, Sohn, and Starnitz in the context of ADS-CFT duality derived exactly this relation in, uh, in the following setting. You have a supersymmetric Yang-Mills theory. Uh, they consider it in a thermal state. The plasma has some shear viscosity, but according to the ADS-CFT duality, this plasma is dual to a gravitational configuration of a black hole in anti desitter space. And using that duality, they could calculate, using uh, the um, microscopic formula, Kubo formula, for the shear viscosity in terms of stress tensor correlation functions, they could relate that to a scattering amplitude of gravitons on the black hole background. And when they did so, they came up with a number for the shear viscosity of this Yang-Mills supersymmetric Yang-Mills plasma. And it was precisely the same as I found here, universal ratio of uh, shear viscosity to entropy density. So um, according to this perspective, my perspective, the reason that works, I mean, According to my perspective, what this shows is that these people that claim that the, that the gauge theory is really dual to a gravity theory uh, are right. 
So anyway, that's an amazing thing. This I'll skip very quickly. We considered in our recent work, what about if the entropy density has corrections that do depend on the radius of curvature? Uh, we considered a simple class of such corrections that's polynomial on the Ricci scale. And uh, we showed that actually, once again, we could derive the Einstein equation. But uh, in this case, the equilibrium required that the area not be constant at P. So uh, the expansion had to be non-zero. And that required introduction of now a bulk viscosity in addition to the shear viscosity. And I think I'll just skip that and invite you to look at the paper if that sounds interesting. So I want to get to sort of what does it all mean? Or at least, yeah. So, huh. It looks like we've shown that any theory that has local Poincaré invariance, and that's, I invoke that to get the, uh, the unroom effect, the thermal nature of the vacuum, um, must, well, in a positive energy condition, it actually underlies this uh, bissignano vickman theorem, that it must have gravity. In other words, I'm not allowed to consider a world without gravity. How could that possibly be that I just showed you that there must be gravity in the world? I mean, couldn't we just write down a relativistic quantum field theory in Minkowski space that has no gravity? And the answer is, yes, we could. But remember, if you do that, that quantum field theory will have an infinite entropy density. So when you run this argument, you'll find out that Newton's constant is zero for that theory. So it has no gravity. So that's consistent. But still, if you think somebody, I mentioned this argument, and somebody once in the audience of another talk pointed out quite readily, but doesn't the argument still imply in that case that the vacuum Einstein equation must hold? So if you turn off G, you still have Ricci tensor equals zero. And I hope it doesn't imply that because I can always consider quantum field theory in a curved, fixed curved background that's not Ricci flat. Why can't I consider that? So what breaks down in my argument there? And here I have not as good an answer. The best I can come up with is this. If the, we're talking now about a relativistic quantum field theory, so we have infinite entropy density. And uh, maybe when the entropy density is infinite, uh, I can't really apply the Clausius relation, even with an internal entropy production, because I'm comparing infinity with infinity. And uh, well, that's the best I can come up with to say why my argument doesn't apply. But it, it better not apply. Okay, so can we test this idea in what do I mean by that? Can I ask something else? Yes. So you're arguing that okay, you have to have gravity, but it's more than that, you have to have gravity as described by Einstein's theory. Right. Which is a much stronger. Uh, yeah. Do you have any way of, I mean, Bransky theory of well, black holes and presumably all of that? Well, that's the part I skipped over quickly. We, the, the, part, the only thing I can tell you that I've actually looked at is what if the uh, entropy density, once you've assumed the entropy is just proportional to the area, you get Einstein gravity. If you allow some other function that the entropy is in, then you get a different equation of state. So we showed that you could get the higher derivative corrections to Einstein gravity by including higher derivative corrections to the entropy. Well, some derivative corrections. A Ricci scalar. And it's an interesting question how widely you could follow that path. Like, could you get Brands Dickey? Could you get Lovelock gravity? You know, we only consider a polynomial in the Ricci scalar. Mm -hmm. I hope you like the idea that the Nova gravity is unstable. Put some curvature in, put some metric in, it curves as little as you like. And then do you then do your field theory that you will induce curvature when you renormalize, and you get induced gravity from zero point effects. Oh, so you're you saying will, actually will test so, you. so 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 you're, if you're finding an unstable situation. So is your point that uh, mathematically pure quantum field theory in a fixed background is from a physical point of view? If it's flat, if it's on, uh, yeah. That's maybe. 
Uh, okay, good. So what I mean by testing, what, <laughs> you sure you want to ask a question? What I mean by testing the idea is um, what I did was assume from the outset that the entropy is proportional to the area and uh, deduce the Einstein equation and the relation between Newton's constant and the entropy density. Could we find a situation where we can actually calculate the entanglement entropy and the induced Newton constant and see if it really works that way? That's a pretty tall order because we don't have quantum gravity here. But coming again to ADS-CFT, we do have actually in ADS-CFT uh, a knowledge of the quantum gravity theory reduced to a non-gravitational theory. Remember, the, the conformal field theory has no gravity in it, and it's dual to quantum string theory, which includes gravity. So in that context, however, uh, the CFT is a, it's just on a fixed background and there's no gravity, so I can't test the idea. It has no cutoff. The conformal field theory has an infinite number of degrees of freedom. It has an infinite entanglement entropy. However, people have considered fairly recently the situation where instead of putting the boundary, the, the conformal field theory at the infinite boundary of anti desiderate space, it's put at a finite location. And one imagines a kind of brain there. I think, I don't know this field very well, but it's called the Randall syndrome brain. And then the theory on that surface at a finite location is dual to the bulk theory on the inside. And it turns out that that theory, the field theory at the finite ADS radius, it has evidently both Poincare invariance and an ultraviolet cutoff in some appropriate sense that I don't really understand myself, except that I think it's that if you go up to too high an energy, fields sort of leak off the brain. You can no longer analyze the system as being confined to the brain. And this theory, in, indeed, so it has a cutoff, so it has a finite entropy. So according to me, it better have gravity. And indeed, it has gravity. And people are able to calculate both the entanglement entropy and the induced Newton constant in this theory, and see how it scales with n, which is the number of colors in the Yang Mills theory, and the cutoff. And sure enough, the entanglement entropy and the induced Newton constant are related in just the way they're supposed to be. This was first looked at by Hawking, Mollison, and Strominger in a, in a case of two dimensional field theory. And Roberto Emperon this year actually uh, extended it to higher dimensions. So in that sense, it can be tested. I'm out of time for this. I'm going to skip the, Hawk, the implications for Hawking radiation, unfortunately, uh, and just go to the summary. So, um, so what did I say? Black hole entropy has little to do with black holes. It's really a property of causal horizons. The equation of state of vacuum thermodynamics of causally defined regions is the Einstein equation with Newton's constant, the inverse of the universal entanglement entropy density. Horizon shear entails entropy production, and the ratio of shear viscosity to entropy density is universal. Curvature corrections, this is the part I didn't explain in detail, also entail entropy production. That's the bulk viscosity I mentioned. And uh, what I was going to say about Hawking radiation is that the Radiate existence of Hawking radiation and the corresponding entropy implies that mode conversion must take place to supply the outgoing modes uh, in the absence of a transplankian reservoir. And the reason there's no transplankian reservoir is that if there were, the entropy wouldn't be finite. So I can't explain that now. I just want to end with what is the message? I started by saying, what is the message? Okay, so uh, what is the message? I don't know. I really don't know, okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> but I felt like if I'm going to ask you to sit here for an hour and listen to me, I should just try my best. So this is my best guess at what the message is. <coughs> First of all, gravity implies that there is a UV cutoff, okay? 
people have for years wondered, maybe quantum gravity cuts off the divergences by some grace of God. I'm saying it's by the necessity of thermodynamics, there's a UV cutoff. The universality of entropy area density uh, is a feature of whatever quantum gravity vacuum ends up being the right theory. And so we conclude, since the Einstein equation is an equation of state of thermodynamics, that gravity is thermodynamics. But this is puzzling, because we also know that gravity is a quantum field. We can write the action, we vary it, we quantize the perturbations, We've even seen them effectively, presumably in the cosmic microwave background, the effect of quantized gravity fluctuations to scalar mode. So it's, it's thermodynamics, but it's also quantized. Doesn't that, is why, doesn't that contradict? Don't these things contradict each other? So the best example I could think of so far is second sound in helium two. This is called. Uh, this is a, an excitation of the ground state of liquid helium, superfluid helium, in which there's a, uh, a, an entropy wave or a thermal uh, excitation, but at the same time a, a, a disturbance of the superfluid condensate in such a way that the, end, uh, the uh, mass density of the fluid is unperturbed, and there's a kind of coherent oscillation of the thermal state of the normal fluid and the superfluid component. And uh, I just asked Robert Kraut at lunch whether, is it true that those second sound waves are quantum quasi-particles, excitations of the fluid? And he said to me, it must be, I hope you're willing to stand behind this, it must be because if it wasn't, given that these interact with other components of the fluid, uh, uh, the, the canonical commutation relations of the quantized part would be destroyed. It wouldn't be a consistent system if this excitation, which does touch the other ones, was not quantized. So best I can think is this is sort of analogous. It's somehow at the same time a thermal excitation and it is quantum. And, the va and that's the way we have to think about the vacuum in quantum gravity. Uh, I'll just stop there. I seem to recall that um, there were some intrinsic problems to do with reduced gravity. All the work of Stephen Adam and trying to calculate the gravitational constant. In fact, there's a lot of science. And no one's ever been able to solve that problem as far as I know. However, you're saying that, that we have to do this. My second question is you made the statement that we see quantum gravity in the CMP. I don't, what do you mean by that? I didn't think we see quite gravity anyway. Well, maybe Robert, who's sitting next to you, can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the modes whose perturbations we do see the effect of are coupled uh, in photon scalar metric perturbation modes. Okay, but I disappoint you here. I'm going, to, I'm going to show that they're actually. Uh, classical string thermodynamic fluctuations, <laughs> which have nothing to do with inflation. Okay. <laughs> so, the observations. Then I retract that statement. Uh, so, let's no, 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 use gravity. Uh, what's the story in that? Because there's been problems with that. Yeah, people try to, to, to set up induced gravity in a well defined field theory framework. And you're right, every attempt has failed for one reason or another. So, uh, but the supposition that this should be possible within the framework of field theory is not justified. So, uh, that's the best I can give you as an answer. I can't write a self-contained quantum field theory because the fields are describing effective degree, effective Low energy effective degrees of freedom that aren't the appropriate language to properly formulate uh, what the true nature of this uh, relation between the entropy and the uh, 
Well, but what, what determines the entropy? The field degrees of freedom are not the right language. I guess that's what I infer from it. Mm -hmm. Just a point to clarify. Uh, Robert, would you agree that uh, it doesn't have to retract the state, right? You're just saying that if you don't believe in the state and come up with another theory, then you can give a different explanation of what was going on, what we are seeing in the CMD. But within inflation, it was right. Like yeah, but I was making the claim, the statement that we'd actually seen, we have already seen the effects of quantum gravity, and Robert's saying, you know, maybe what we're seeing is explained in this other way. I disagree with that. Would you elaborate on your statement that you don't need a Trump-Frankian reservoir just to make walking photons? And when you know that, when you extrapolate backwards, you go into the Trump-Frankian right. distance. Okay, the logic is, uh, I'm inferring that you must not need one. Okay, so here's the reasoning. Given that I've inferred that the entropy must be finite, the number of degrees of freedom must be finite. But in the standard picture of where the Hawking radiation comes from, it comes from this infinitely deep transplantian reservoir at the horizon, well, which would carry an infinite or entropy way above the one that the Beckenstein Hawking entropy gives. So if I'm saying that I've, I'm convinced that that reservoir is not there because it would have contributed too much entropy, but and I have to explain to you where the hell the Hawking radiation yeah. comes from. Yeah. Right, so I, I'm just saying, I'm inferring, it must be that these modes, that are the outgoing modes near the horizon, are produced by some form of what I call mode conversion. They're sucked out of the vacuum, or they're created, or they're turned around from ingoing modes. There are models in free field theory with dispersion where you can kind of see ways of producing modes that are coming away from horizons that didn't start there. Those are just toy models. It occurred to me in writing this that given that the ADS-CFT uh, duality has done so much for us, maybe we can ask it to do more. Think about a black hole on the randall sundrum brain, which has a cutoff, presumably has no transplantian uh, reservoir that's infinitely deep at the horizon, and ask in that setting, how does that black hole on that brain come up with its outgoing modes? So there should be some mechanism, maybe according like what Renault was talking about and actually his talk on expanding cosmology, that the modes somehow come from the extra dimensions in that model. And it would be great to see that explicitly if you possibly could. I don't know. I'm just inferring that they but must come from somewhere else. If, if, the, if the black hole collapses, and if it makes available to our space one Frankian unit around its surface, and you believe in the graininess of the underlying space, aren't you liberating space and therefore making available the reservoir of the mode that you need? We have, we have a black hole. So we are limiting the space available to us from the horizon of the black hole. But then there's a self-consistent process which I envisage in which the, the horizon is beginning to fluctuate and, and little space gets available. It, it makes a grain. Space that used to for be us, inside? For us. You mean space that used to be inside the horizon? or a new piece of space? I only know the space I see, which is virtual space. I can't see inside. All right. So my space increases by one Planckian unit. Yeah. It's available to me now. It didn't used to be available. Right. It's a self-consistent process. That, so I can make a mode from that reservoir, which, Maybe. Well, what, what you like. It's now available to me. It's a self-consistent process. The yeah. shrinking and the liberation go together. Yeah, it sounds nice. I like the space fleshed out. I don't know how to describe that. But that's the concept of a reservoir. It's because the horizon has hidden what I can get hold of. But once I can, then it manifests itself in my world. Maybe. Oh, it's a nice idea. So, yeah. 
Okay, uh, so this is a question about fluctuations. So if you have a box of gas, you know that P equals N is not really true. I mean, you have fluctuations in pressure and so on. Do you have any handle of doing this another thing for, uh, for gravity? So you have some fluctuations around, uh, so you have fluctuations in the metric and so on. In, so again, I, I haven't thought about it, but it's a good question. If we have take seriously this thermal state that the whole thing is built around, one knows something about those fluctuations, and maybe you can get some mileage out of that. Yeah, the, the variance, I mean, so presumably the... Yeah. <coughs> I don't know. Some, some, some I've average. never seen anybody uh, try to do that. People have talked about black hole fluctuations in a kind of global sense. <laughs> But I like the idea of looking at them locally. Maybe, maybe you could do something. So in your derivation, basically, it seems that you're um, taking the Beckett and Hawking relation as fundamental, but that's just a single classical result. You know that. Well, you know? Yeah, I'm taking it as fundamental yeah. the proportion. Well, then you then the, 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 the entropy density, you, you could zero slider uh, probability corrections, but at the beginning. It seems like the biggest option regulation for you is just fundamental, right? So you're not considering the possibility of uh, quantum gravity corrections. No, it's like phenomenological. I, maybe you're slightly, when you say fundamental, don't forget. Well, fundamental, think, okay, in some way. But I think it's crucial that the coefficient is purely phenomenological in my viewpoint. I'm not tying it to Newton's constant at the, at the starting point. It's well, no, just I'm talking about the functional dependence of the entropy. Right, the that's just the lowest term in some Right. A proper expansion, but it's the dominating term because the point length is so. So you think your derivation can still hold when you have higher order Planck and corrections to this entropy relation? Yeah, that's what I was saying. We've shown it works if you add, for example, the only case I know is a polynomial in the Ricci scalar. Right. Yeah, but you didn't. Yeah, you didn't mention any link with quantum gravity. Or anything when you when you said I or I or well right. quantum gravity presumably the Einstein Hilbert term is just the lowest order term in right. the quantum gravity effect of that yeah I'm saying that might be related also to the appearance of logarithmic terms in the entropy area relation that, oh like the ones you see in the quantum gravity for example you count the yeah yes mm -hmm. I don't know if those logarithmic corrections are related to terms in the effective action in any well, I, I'm, what I'm saying is that it might be a way to link. Yeah, that would be these two aspects, right? Yeah. Yes. Well, um, okay. I think there's a problem with the, the log of logarithmic correction because then you have to assume that it's it's. I mean, part of the assumption is that it's local, right? You equate those two finger ends. It has to be oh, yeah, yeah. something over the surface, whereas the log of the area. Yeah, well, you're assuming that they say that you're extending the from like a black hole to any causal horizon. So yeah, no, no, you're right. That's going to be, also actually it should be remembered that that law of correction is so tiny that it's completely dependent on the precise ensemble that you take for the equilibrium. Don Page emphasized this in his uh, review article on black hole thermodynamics, and he calculated for a bunch of different ensembles how the corrections change and identified how ambiguous they are. So there's, a, there's sort of a global issue that's raised before you can make sense of that kind of a correction. If I can come back to my earlier question. So I might be wrong, but my, my reflection is that if you take Brandt's sticky theory and uh, look at its black hole solutions, I think that all that Schwarzschild black hole is uh, a solution to uh, the Bransky theory. Yes, it is. So assuming this, and assuming that while well, you get the same entropy relation for a Schwarzschild black hole in Bransky theory, if you start from the entropy result and work out what the field equations have to be, you'll get the wrong answer. Because your root leads to Einstein, not Bransky. So I'm wondering. What do you call it? I suspect we can actually pick up the brain sticky. Uh, you may have to start more. One issue that's going to arise is um, is the brown sticky field contributing to the heat flow that appears in the Clausius relation or not? And that may depend on what, what one think of as the length scale of the brown sticky field. 
And if it's long compared, to, if it's of the same order as the radius of curvature of the space time, then for the purpose of my argument, it may as well be a constant. So then the question would just be, can I admit a constant appropriately in what I'm doing? But the answer is yes, of course, because I just had a phenomenological constant anyway. So we could talk about it and see if it's if there's a problem with that. I, it's not clear to me that there's. You might have to. I mean, you have to find true definitions for heat, true definitions for local density reduction, and there's a danger that you might always tune your definitions to suit the result. Yeah. Yeah, I thought we thought about that some, and I don't have anything really good to say, but I would like to talk with you about it. You could always make a field redefinition and get rid of the brand sticky field in the entropy. Just include the correspond resulting scalar field that's uh, in your heat current, and then of course you get the correct field equation. But is that something you have to know in, in advance that you should do that, or can we argue that it's somehow inevitable according to this philosophy? I don't know. So when you use energy conservation to you use energy conservation to figure out what the trace mm -hmm. part of the um, trace equation is, and it was still a few parameter which is lambda. Yeah. So is there anything one could say about how lambda relates to heat? From this point of view, I can see no way to say anything. Completely undetermined in the usual sense. I might be wrong, but uh, I've seen other people try to determine it but not succeed. <laughs> <laughs>